So we've been in this series called What You Don't Know About Jesus Could Ruin Your Life. And we've been basically spending some time with Jesus walking through the Gospels. And so this morning we are in John chapter 12. And the, the reading is in two parts. And so it starts off with chapter 12, 1 through 6. It says, Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary, his, Lazarus' other sister, took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. But Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you'll not always have me. Then skipping down to verse 23, he explains a little bit more about this. Jesus replied, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be willing to go where I go. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. This is the word of the Lord. So it was almost Passover, which was the biggest holiday of the year for Jesus and his friends. And this dinner party that they were at, it was kind of like when you have some Christmas parties with your friends in the weeks before December 25th. And it really hadn't been very long ago that Jesus had raised his buddy Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus, he was there at the dinner. And his two sisters, Mary and Martha, they were also at the party and a bunch of people who had seen the miracle. See, they were all together for this meal. And Martha, she was doing most of the work, as usual, while Lazarus and Mary were just sitting there at Jesus' side, hanging out, hanging on every word that he said. This banquet was in Jesus' honor, and it was supposed to be a festive occasion. But it kind of seems like Jesus kept saying weird stuff about how he was going to be betrayed and given over to his enemies, he was going to be killed, and then he was going to raise the life on the third day. And sometimes when Jesus brought this stuff up, sometimes they would argue with him about it. But that never went well when they did. And all of this is happening. It's just a week before all that stuff was going to take place. The betrayal and standing before Pilate and the cross. So it was supposed to be this happy event in Jesus' honor but it does seem like there's a bit of an ominous mood in the air. So they finish eating, and Mary leaves the room, and she goes and she gets this jar, and it's filled with expensive perfume, and she kneels down, and she pours the jar on Jesus' feet. Probably put some on his head, too. And everyone at that party, they were as surprised that she did this as you would have been. It's not something people did. <laughs> this jar was about a quart of very expensive fragrant oil. It said the jar was worth an entire year's wages. Can you imagine somebody pouring something like $15,000 worth of perfume on someone's feet? What the heck was she thinking? But I think Mary had seen something like this before. Because in Luke chapter 7, there's another event where this sinful woman, 
probably a prostitute, where she washes Jesus' feet with her hair using her tears. And then it says that she rubs a little of this same kind of perfume on his feet, which was so scandalous. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they rebuked Jesus for letting him do this. He said, if you knew what kind of woman you were letting touch you right now, you would not be letting that happen, man. But see, Jesus defended her at that time. And I think Mary knew about that. She might have been there. And I think she was trying to express how deeply thankful she was to Jesus. So she's trying to honor him in some big, amazing, extravagant way. But you know what? Anytime you do something from the heart, anytime you take the risk to show sincere love and sincere devotion, you know what happens. There's going to be some cynical jerk who tries to ruin it. Just try wearing a my wife is awesome t-shirt to work someday. See how that goes for you. (laughs) The disciple named Judas, he thought this was a ridiculous, ridiculous waste of resources. Judas was the treasurer for the disciples, which means he kept the money bag, the the money purse. So whenever he wanted something, he just kind of took some money out for himself. Cash flow. He was a thief. And in just a few days, you know, Judas was going to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But today he just wanted to ruin this tender moment of worship and thankful adoration. He's like, what a waste, man. We could have sold that. We could have given the money to the poor. Imagine how many people we could have helped. Which was something they did. I mean, remember, Jesus had instructed a certain rich young ruler to sell everything he had and to give the money to the poor. So Judas might have been thinking, yeah, give it to the poor, like me. I mean, I'm poor, give it to me. But the Bible tells us that he didn't care about helping the poor. He just wanted the money to go in the money bag so that he'd have access to it. And Jesus tells him to get off her case. He said she had just anointed him for his burial. That was probably a weird thing to hear at a dinner party. But Jesus, he knows his time's running out. He says, you're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me, at least not like this. I think it was probably the last thing Mary was actually intending to imply by pouring the perfume on him, though, don't you? She's trying to honor him. She's trying to love him, show humility and thankfulness, sure. But anoint him for his burial? Hmm, I don't think so. I don't think that's what she had in mind. But that's what Jesus said she was doing. She did this for the day of my burial. I wonder how she felt about that when he said it. So then we jump down to verse 23. And Jesus explains things in a little bit more detail. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And by that he means the cross. Jesus was going to die on the cross for Mary and for everyone else, for everyone in that room and for you and for me and for the whole world. Jesus was going to die and then on the third day he was going to rise from the dead, which was going to prove that everything he had ever said in his ministry was true. Anyone who believes in his life, death, and resurrection, anyone who believes that he did it for them they would be saved, they'd be forgiven, they'd be made right with God. They'd be given the gift of everlasting life. Mary's brother Lazarus, he's right there. He had just been raised from the dead. This wasn't like a big stretch of their imagination that this could happen. And Jesus was gonna rise from the dead and he promised that anyone who believed in him would do the same. Follow Jesus and you will live forever. Follow Jesus. Then he goes on to explain what following him is going to look like. He says, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's just going to be a single seed. And a single seed can't do anything. But if it dies, it makes a whole bunch of seeds. And a whole bunch of seeds, that can grow into a crop. 
that can like feed a whole bunch of people. See, Jesus is saying that if anyone says they're following him, but they hold on to their life because they love their life, then they're like that stupid little seed. Just worthless. Nothing good's going to come out of that. If we hold on to our life, we're going to lose it. Tim Keller, he tells a really great story to illustrate this point. He tells a story about a guy who was rafting near a dam, and he falls into some very cold water. And he gets caught in the backwash that's at the base of this dam, which makes this whirlpool near the drain. And the whirlpool, it's really strong. And this guy, he's swimming as hard as he can to fight against it. He's struggling. He's trying to stay alive. He can't beat it. And the water, it's almost freezing. So he just keeps swimming. And eventually, the guy just dies of hypothermia before the suction from the whirlpool pulls him under for good. But here's the thing, just a few seconds later, his body pops up on the other side. See, there was no way he could have known this, but if he just would have stopped swimming and let the water take him, if he didn't struggle against it, he would have been fine. The current that he thought was going to kill him would have saved him. It's a pretty good illustration of what Jesus means by if you hold on to your life, then you're going to lose it. But if you let go of your life for my sake, then you'll find it. See, Jesus says whoever is going to serve him is going to have to follow him. And if we follow him, then that means we're going to end up going where he goes. Logic. And see, at first that might look like we're going to get sucked down the drain and drown. Jesus went to the cross. But on the third day, he rose from the grave. He walked the earth again. He ascended to heaven, sat at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, which is kind of like popping up on the other side of the dam a few seconds later. Surprising. Jesus said if we honor him, which means we serve him, which means we follow him, then he said, God the Father will honor us. But see, following Jesus, it's counterintuitive. Because sometimes we think Jesus wants to rob us of all our fun and all our joy and all our freedom. Like following Jesus would be the death of our options and our potential but it's really the birth of those things along with real joy and freedom and life. If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're really going to follow Jesus in the way that leads to life and hope and salvation, then we're going to have to abandon our pride. We're going to have to abandon our life and give him everything we have, everything we are. But it's hard to abandon our pride. In this story, Mary did a bunch of disgraceful things. She did. She was washing his dusty, nasty, hot, stinky feet. We're so used to the Bible stories about Jesus washing the disciples' feet and, you know, Mary washing his feet with her hair. We don't really get how weird this is. It was a funky job. In some Roman municipalities, it was actually illegal to force your slaves to wash your feet because it was too demeaning. Also in the story, Mary lets her hair down. That just didn't happen in polite society. It was considered very improper for a woman to untie her hair in public. And she didn't just let her hair down. She was using her hair to wipe his feet. And Mary didn't seem to care what anyone thought about that. She didn't care that Martha was probably mad at her for not starting on the dishes. She didn't care that Lazarus was probably getting embarrassed by his sister's overly emotional public display of affection. She didn't care what the uptight religious folks in the room thought. 
and she certainly didn't care what Judas had to say about anything. And that was before people stopped naming their kids Judas. It's like Mary's just looking at Jesus and she's saying, I don't care what anyone else thinks. I know who you are. And I want to give you all my devotion. My pride's not going to get in the way of me doing that. That's hard. When I was a new Christian, I started going to the local Assembly of God church in my small town. And the Assemblies of God, they're a charismatic bunch, which means they get pretty emotional when they sing and when they pray. And they'd raise their hands and they would sing like they actually meant what they were singing. Maybe even look a little undignified at times. And so I learned what it meant to go to church and what it meant to worship with them in that context. But I never got particularly comfortable with some of it, especially once they really got going, once it really came to a boil. When I graduated high school, I went to an Assembly of God Bible College because I had the intention of becoming a pastor. But while I was there, I kind of saw the worst of things. I saw a lot of goofy stuff. And I'm not saying that it was all goofy because I'm very thankful to the Assembly of God for introducing me to God's word and for discipling me when I was new to the faith. There were a lot of great people But there were some turkeys too. I mean, there were some hypocrites. There were people who faked these big, super spiritual freak shows just to kind of make themselves look spiritual, to look good. And I got jaded. I I never stopped believing in Jesus, but I kind of stopped believing in Christians. I stopped calling myself a Christian I'd still pray, I'd still read the Bible, I still believe Jesus is who he says he is. But I followed Jesus at a pretty safe distance from all the other weird followers. Because I was embarrassed by them. The TV evangelists, the simple-minded Bible thumpers with their God said it, I believe it, that settles it bumper stickers. I let my pride get in the way. I was too proud to be associated with all those idiots. You ever felt that way? One day it dawned on me what I was doing though. You can't say you're following Jesus and then pretend at the same time like all the other billions of people who are following him aren't there. That's called being delusional. Anyone who gets between you and God, they're going to be closer to God than you are by default. So eventually I did start calling myself Christian again. I moved from jaded to what I call post-jaded. Post-jaded is a much better place to be. So then fast forward a few years later. I'm in the back of a church. I'm singing along with some praise song, one that I kind of like. I was singing and I was feeling it. And I opened my eyes for a moment and I notice there's a few people in the room who are raising their hands in worship while they're singing. And all of a sudden I felt that old feeling, the one that I hadn't felt in years. Like my arms were as heavy as lead pipes, just dangling at my sides feeling self-conscious for not raising my hands, like I was being some kind of a rebel. And I kind of felt like God was saying, so what's the deal, Frank? You too good to raise your hands in worship? Is that beneath you now? In a charismatic church, I always feel like the A between two Ys. Yay. Look, I don't usually have to deal with this at all because, you know, I'm standing up here holding the guitar. My hands are occupied. (laughs) So anyway, I raised my dang hands and I sang the song. Later, Pastor Matt came up to me and he said, 
what was the deal with you getting all Pentecostal in church today? <laughs> you know, because he's a good friend. And friends, if friends can't mock each other, what are they good for, right? <laughs> so Mary was hoping to host this, host this dinner party for Jesus. And rather than being self-conscious and just sitting in polite awkwardness, she worshipped Jesus with everything she had. She didn't have the attitude of being too cool to worship Jesus. She didn't have the attitude that God owed her something, like she was trying to protect her pride, like hanging out with Jesus was somehow a way for her to get something from him. Now, she didn't think God owed her anything. She just thought, I owe you everything, Lord. And I think that's where we have to be. I think we have to abandon everything to Jesus. Abandon our life. Just like the guy who falls out of the raft. is trying to swim against the whirlpool. See, we were born swimming against a whirlpool. And it's hard just to let go of that impulse for self-preservation. Those motivations are kind of built in, guys. And when it comes to church, those motivations, they look like this. They look like, I don't know, nostalgia. Like some people want to do this church thing as long as it takes care of some need to honor their sense of family value or social decency, some nostalgic thing. That's why they go to church. Like, you know, like it just makes us feel better if we go to church. And we say if we miss church, man, we just don't feel right. We go to church because it's the way we were raised. It's just part of a normal, decent life. And that's why you go. Which all sounds logical. It all sounds fine. But it's not the gospel. Other motivations are things like bargaining with God. You know, we go to church because it's part of some deal we're trying to make with him. Like, I'll go to church because I need protection and healing and help and If I expect God to help me, then I'm going to have to do my part. I'm going to have to go to church. I'm going to have to be good. Got to keep those Ten Commandments. Got to give to the poor. And all those things are good. They are. We should do those things. But they're not the gospel. These are not the motivations that we need to encourage bubbling up in our heart to lead us to worship and to be thankful to God. Because false motives like those, they're just gonna wear us down. They're gonna burn us out. Mary's motivation seems to be pure. As pure as the expensive perfume that she's pouring on his feet. I don't even think she understood the implications of what she was doing. Jesus had said that he was going to die and that he was going to raise to life on the third day. She had heard him say that, but I don't think Mary understood what that meant any more than the rest of the disciples did. She was just given her worship without holding anything back. She was laying down her pride. She wasn't thinking about self-preservation. And when she did that, when she did that, it just fell in line with God's will beyond anything she could have come up with on her own. Which, I mean, think about it. If we want our life to have meaning and purpose and beauty and joy, if we want those things in our life, then we have to let go of our life. We have to abandon our life to Jesus. We don't have to understand it. We're not gonna understand it. The peace of God that passes all understanding, you're not gonna understand that up front before you get it. No, we just have to give him everything. Hold nothing back. We're not going to pop out safely on the other side of the dam if we hold anything back. If we just keep on swimming. But I think we all see Judas's point, right? There's nothing wrong with helping the poor. It was a lot of money. Jesus does command us to help the poor. Mary poured an entire year's wages on Jesus' feet. That perfume had to just stink up the whole room. 
his feet probably smelled better before. I would have been diving for the window just to breathe. There's a lot of wonderful smells in the world, like Indian food and apple pie and smoked brisket, but perfume, that's not one of them. I probably would have been more like Judas than Mary in that situation, which is not the place I want to be. That's not the company that you really want. Judas didn't get it. He just didn't see it. He could not see that what Mary was doing was beautiful and meaningful and worshipful. See, Judas was following Jesus for more what he could get out of it than for what being a follower actually means. To be a servant, a soldier, a disciple, a brother. See, to follow Jesus is to be adopted into a new family. It's to move our citizenship to a new country. It's to join a different team, to enlist in a different army. It's to marry someone and to give them not only our whole heart, but all of our worldly treasure. It's a total paradigm shift. It changes everything. It costs everything. Look, you can't talk about following Jesus without, cost, without talking about the cost, because it's gonna cost everything. Is it worth it? Yeah, of course it's worth it. What does it profit for a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? Followers of Jesus are laying up treasure in heaven, which is a different way of looking at wealth, what wealth actually is. It doesn't look anything like the way Ebenezer Scrooge would see it or Montgomery Burns or even a spoiled brat who never learned the joy of giving and the kindness of sharing their toys. It doesn't look like that. Following Jesus means that we give him whatever we have and to do that with joy because we know that keeping it would ruin it. It would ruin us. It's knowing that everything we have, everything we have comes from God. So we just offer to give it back immediately. Our only question when God gives us something should be this. Why did he give it to me? What for? What does he want me to do with it? If God blesses us with something, then we know it's so that we can turn around and be a blessing to someone else. We're not supposed to act like buckets. We're supposed to be more like funnels. And I know this is hard because I know we all want to hold on to our stuff. The last part of a person to be redeemed is usually their wallet. When it comes to the local church, how much money are we supposed to give on a regular basis as part of our worship? How much are we supposed to give? God says faithful giving looks like about 10%, a tithe, which sounds crazy to unbelievers. That's as crazy as pouring $15,000 worth of perfume on Jesus' feet. Nobody likes to talk about money in church. I can see y'all's faces. I wish I never had to talk about money, but the problem is Jesus talks about money all the time. Because what we do with our money is a pretty good indication of where we're at in our discipleship in following Jesus. Look, New Church is a ministry that is intentionally trying to reach people who are either new to this whole church thing or were hurt, disillusioned by some church in their past, which we think is really important. People need to know about the love and the grace of God that's only found in Jesus. That's why we do this. That's the only way life makes any sense. It's the only way life has any purpose. It's the only way life has any hope. But if we're going to minister to people who really don't know how this whole church family thing works, then guess what? They're going to be hesitant to invest in a church. Which means there's always going to be a small core of us that are going to have to lead the way to give the other people time to grow in their faith and to grow in their faithfulness. 
you might be surprised to learn that there's only about eight families here at New Church that pay for the majority of this ministry. And a couple of those families aren't even members. They don't even go here. They just support what we're doing. Look, I didn't think it'd be possible to talk about the follower of Jesus who lays down her pride and her life and gives such an extravagant offering of worship without at least mentioning money. It wouldn't be right. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there you will find your heart, right? You want to know where your heart is? Look at your checking account. But it works the other way, too. If you want your heart to be pointed in a certain direction, start putting your money there. And that's part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because as followers of Jesus, he's called us to abandon our pride, abandon our life, and to give him everything we have, everything we are. To trust that he loves us and he knows what's best for us. See, we have a tendency to make it conditional. We have a tendency to make it if. I'll do what God tells me to do, if. But see, if is not the deal. If keeps us in control. If is not surrendering to God. God didn't say, I'll send Jesus to save the world if they'll start behaving. Jesus didn't say, I'll go to the cross to make people right with God if they'll start believing. In other words, I'll die on the cross if they'll stop trying to kill me. Doesn't really make sense. Wouldn't have worked. And it doesn't work for us either. I'll give God everything if he'll give me everything I want. Hmm. I'll stop swimming against the current of this whirlpool if God will rescue me. But Jesus said, unless a seed goes into the ground and dies, it will remain alone. Those who love their life will lose it. But those who follow Jesus, they're going to follow him to a cross. They're going to die to themselves but that seed's going to grow. It's going to sprout new life. See, the great thing is that those who follow Jesus to the cross are also going to follow him to the resurrection, to new life. Follow Jesus all the way into the glory of God, into life everlasting. Romans 6, 3, it says, Or do you not know that all who are baptized are baptized into Christ's death? We were buried with him through baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we'll also live a new life. Do you want hope? Do you want meaning? Do you want your life to have purpose? Do you want to live? Then you got to abandon your pride. you got to abandon your life. You've got to give Jesus everything you have, everything you are. That's what it looks like to follow him. Even if sometimes it feels like the people we're walking with are a bunch of goofballs. Even if it sometimes it feels like we look like some kind of fangirl embarrassing ourselves in front of our friends at a party. Even if the cool, cynical, jaded people think we're acting like Jesus freaks. And it's hard to let go of that stuff. It is challenging on every level. But that's what worshiping God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, that's what it's going to do. It's going to challenge us. Dying to ourself is not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be pleasant. It wouldn't be called dying if it was, right? But the reward... The reward is eternal life. Jesus said, all who give up their life for my sake, they're going to find it. Everyone who lets go of their life in this world, well, they'll keep it forever. 
if you want to live, you got to stop swimming. You got to stop trying to make life work on your own terms and start following Jesus to where he wants you to go. You got to start becoming the person he created you to be. Stop trying to honor yourself and honor Jesus. What are some of the areas of your life that you're holding on to? Pride? Money? Motivations of bargaining with God? Secret sins? What is God challenging you to surrender? Start honoring him by giving him everything. Because Jesus says, if we do that, then the Father will honor us.